Uh, hello, everybody, and welcome to VATSIM's Cross the Pond Westbound 2024 Pilot Briefing presented by Flight Sim Association, by Slant Alpha Adventures, and by members of VATSIM's leadership. My name is Evan, I'm one of the co founders of Flight Simulation Association, and I am your host for the next roughly hour, hour and a half as we cover everything you need to know about flying in VATSIM's Cross the Pond, the biggest event that VATSIM held each and every year. In fact, twice a year, we're doing the West Westbound edition coming up on Saturday, April the 20th, and then in the fall, we go back and send everybody eastbound. So this is all about flying on the VATSIM network. So for those of you who just got the ping in VPilot or Swift or your VATSIM pilot client, XPilot, welcome to our session. We're predominantly talking to those of you who plan to fly across the pond. However, today's session will be just great overview with good tips and tricks for flying any day of the month on the VATSIM network. We're mostly talking here to people who have some experience flying jetliners on VATSIM, but again, if you are brand new to the concept, that's cool too, and we'll give you plenty of helpful info as we get going. Today's session is all about Cross the Pond, so the big event that we have coming up on Saturday. And over the next roughly 45 to 60 minutes, we'll be talking through departure procedures, so what to do if you're leaving from Europe or Africa, heading westbound across the ocean. In part two, we'll talk about how to actually fly the oceanic procedure. And in part three, we will talk about landing in the Americas. Finally, we'll leave you with some checklists, resources about everything you need to know for flying on Saturday. And of course, we will take the time to answer any and all of your questions. And if you're watching on YouTube with Slant Alpha or Vatsim on Twitch or with us on Flight Sim Association, post your questions to anywhere and everywhere that you're watching. My job during this webinar will be to keep an eye on all of those questions. If you're watching on Vatsim and you want to get directly to us, the best place to post questions would be in the Vatsim Cross the Pond Discord. There is a new channel called Pilot Briefing Q&A and you can post your questions right there. I will collect those questions as the presenters are covering their respective sections, and then of course we'll go through those questions as we wrap up. Now of course the big caveat here, and it's spinning on the screen because that's how important it is, everything we're about to do is not for real world navigation. So this is for home flight simulation purposes on VATSIM, and we are not talking about anything that should be considered for real life aviation. Now, in case you don't know what we're talking about, Cross the Pond is the largest event probably that's happening on VATSIM over the course of the year. We'll have well over a thousand pilots participating. Hopefully we'll see two or three thousand people connected to the network overall on Saturday. And in this edition of the event, we're talking about westbound. So you start in Europe and Africa. If you have a slot and you're part of the event, you then fly across the ocean and land in the Americas. This event is supported by a small group of volunteers. I always love to shout out the Cross the Pond team. There is so much work that goes on in the background that a lot of pilots never see from planning out routes to coordination with the various facilities, making sure that you as a pilot have full ATC coverage every step of the way. So I always love to shout out the work that they do to help us all have a great experience coming up on Saturday. Now here's the most important thing for those of you who don't know much about Cross the Pond, you need a slot booking if you are going to participate in this event. So if you don't have one, I'll tell you how you can potentially get one starting tomorrow. But the main thing to remember is if you want to fly across the pond, you must have booked a slot. If you don't have a slot booking and you don't get one between now and Saturday, you're more than welcome to hang out on the network. There's lots of fun things to do. Fly domestic routes around Europe, fly around Africa, fly in North America, but please do not fly across the ocean during cross the pond. The ATC that that's there is specifically for those who have booked a slot time. There's always on Cross the Pond Day, there's always like a couple of sad controllers who are somewhere that isn't across the pond airport just looking for anything to do. So if you see them, go give them some traffic. That's the best thing you can do if you don't have a booking. You can technically fly in and out of the Cross the Pond airports. Just know that you cannot fly over the Atlantic without a booking. And if you do choose to fly into those Cross the Pond airports, there's a very good chance you'll be delayed or you may be told to just wait a little while before you get to go. Now, if you do have a slot, so if you've already booked a slot, you've gotten the email, you still need to confirm that slot by 2359 Zulu today, April 17th. That's about two hours from now. And if you have not done that by the end of today, that slot will get released tomorrow, which is April 18th, at some time around 1700 Zulu, 
Anything that is not confirmed will be released and will be available for anyone to pick up. Officially, what's planned is that around 1700, the slots will just drop onto the website. And if you're looking and you're lucky enough to refresh quickly, you may just be able to get one. However, if there is a change to that timeline because it's subject to volunteers and tech team and a bunch of different processes in the background, they will send out a ping if it's not exactly at 1700 Zulu. So a good thing if you're looking to get a cross the pond slot and you don't have one would be to keep an eye on that VATSIM CTP Discord tomorrow, April the 18th, somewhere within about a four hour window of 1700 Zulu. That'll be your best chance to still secure a slot. And like I said, if you don't have a slot, feel free to join us on the network on Saturday. Just please, please, please do not fly across the ocean. Now, with that in mind, I'm going to be handing things over to our three presenters, Simon, Ben, and Rob, who are going to talk through each of those three components of today's session. Like I said, this is great for people who are flying across the pond, but even if you don't have a slot, you don't plan to fly on Saturday, lots of great tips for everyday network flying coming up. As I said, my name is Evan. I'm the co-founder of Flight Sim Association. I'll be here monitoring your chats and looking after questions, which we'll take care of at the end. We at Flight Sim Association run this thing called Flight Sim Expo, which some of you may have heard of happening in June in Las Vegas. I know Rob will be there. Several other VATSIM folks will be there supporting our VATSIM live ATC demo area, where we basically present this whole crazy VATSIM thing that we do to the rest of the Flight Sim community, to real world pilots, to those who've never been at Flight Sim Expo or into flight simulation before, trying to get them to understand what it is that we do and why we go spend eight or 10 hours of our Saturday on a long haul flight because, you know, we just love doing this so much. Now, with that in mind, I'll bring on the presenters, but I will share just one more important piece of info, and that is this. If you are flying across the pond, if you do have a booking, you will have access to pilot briefings in the Cross the Pond dashboard. The stuff that we're covering, it's general in nature. It applies to several different airports across many different jurisdictions. But the important thing to remember here is that your specific airports, as well as oceanic procedures, are covered in those briefings. So everything you need to know is in those documents, and those would be great things to review, not only in advance of the day, but even while you are in flight. You know, when you're in cruise heading toward the ocean, that's a great time to pull up that oceanic procedures briefing and have a look at everything there is to share. So with that in mind, let me go ahead and bring on Simon, Ben, and Rob, who will be hanging out with you for the next 45 minutes. I'll be here looking after your questions, and you'll hear from me again once they're done. But Simon, I will go ahead and hand things over to you if you could take us through part one, talking about procedures in Europe for the departure. And Simon, after you take it away, just make sure you're unmuted. I know it's always that scary. There we, go. there it is. Hello. Thank you very much. There we go. Here we are. Thank uh, you very much, Evan. Uh, so uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us today. And uh, as I say, over the next 15 minutes or so, we're going to go through um, some of the procedures that you'll need if you're departing out of Europe to head out across the pond, uh, across the pond. So we'll go through some things like uh, the differences, particularly between flying in the US and Europe around things like transition altitude, transition level, that sort of thing. How are you going to request and get your clearance? Uh, some things you might want to think about when you're briefing your departure. Um, and also uh, some words about CPDLC, which is something which uh, many people are becoming more and more familiar with on the network. It's a great way to alleviate some radio uh, congestion and control the workload as well. So we'll start by talking about transition altitude. Now, if you're familiar with flying mainly in the US, um, the difference biggest difference that you'll find outside the US is that transition level varies, not even country to country, but even airport to airport. It could be as low as 3000 feet. Uh, it could be as high as 11,000 feet in some places. The key thing to know is that it will always be on the chart. Um, something I will just mention here as well, a uh, little bit of a difference between transition altitude and transition level. So transition altitude is the one we need on the way up. It's fixed, it's always on the chart. The transition level is the lowest usable flight level. It's mainly relevant when we're descending. Uh, it will generally not be shown on the charts because it can vary depending on the local pressure and it'll often it'll generally be in the ATIS. But certainly for departure, the transition altitude is always fixed, the point at which we change to standard pressure, and it's, uh, as I say, always gonna be on the charts. You can see some examples on the screen here. 
important thing to note when you do get your clearance is that ATC may well not state an initial climb level in that clearance. Um, the reason for that is that when you get your uh, departure clearance, your SID clearance, the clearance itself implies that you're going to comply with both the lateral and the vertical elements of it. So that includes uh, any stepped climb profiles, any uh, stop altitudes that are shown on the SID. For example, I've highlighted this one in uh, on the chart uh, here out of uh, Gatwick, I think it is. Uh, the initial climb clearance is 4,000. That won't necessarily be stated by ATC. You're expected to have seen that and looked at that on the chart. Something else I'm going to highlight here is uh, this instruction on this chart, which is again a in, essentially an initial climb, clear, climb clearance on the SID to flight level uh, 060. Now, just have a think about why that might be significant and what some of the implications might be, and we'll circle back to that in a little while. As I mentioned, uh, it's important to bear in mind that uh, not all SIDs will just be a straight climb to a cleared level. Uh, some have stepped climb profiles. This is an example here on the chart here out of uh, Gatwick, the uh, Lambourne uh, 6 mic departure. And uh, you can see here that there are uh, certainly uh, different level restrictions and some which are at or below restrictions, followed by a climb to a new level as you carry on further around the departure. Question that you need to ask yourself when you're briefing the departure is how are you going to do that, right? So the expectation again is that you will follow that vertical stepped profile um, regardless, uh, unless ATC some, say something to override it. Now, in reality, uh, the general uh, procedure is that you will follow those altitudes up with the MCP. Uh, so you would set, in this case, the lowest initial climb here is 4,000 feet, followed by a step up to 5,000 feet. So the expectation is you would set 4,000 in your altitude window prior to departure. Then uh, when you get to this point, you then wind it up to 5,000 and so on. Even if you're using VNAV or some sort of managed vertical mode that will automatically manage those steps for you, the reason for that in real life, one of the reasons for it is that ATC in reality will see that selected level and they get a bit uncomfortable if they see something other than in accordance with that stepped profile. Uh, another reason is that it serves as a nice handy little uh, backup as well. Uh, just in case uh, you've missed a constraint out or something like that within the FMS programming. Uh, a note about your flight plan and the uh, flight planned altitude uh, that you get. You'll get one with your uh, cross the pond slot. The important thing to note is that it is relevant to the oceanic crossing only. Uh, so before and after you uh, are on the ocean, uh, you can use a different level. The important thing is that you are at your uh, cross the pond slot level at the point at which you enter oceanic. Um, don't worry too much about that in the sense that it is the responsibility of ATC, mainly our, uh, particularly for westbound, our friends in Shannon, <laughs> um, to get you to that level. They know from your flight plan, provided you filed it correctly, what level you need to be at. Uh, and they're there to work with you and negotiate uh, with you to, to get you to the level that you need to be. So don't panic, just request it. If you're not at that level, they should know about it, but requ request it if you need to, and they're there to help you get to that level to make sure everything's organized on the track. Um, when you're requesting clearance, uh, slightly different uh, compared to the US, uh, depending on where you are in Europe. Uh, in the UK, uh, we like to hear stand, well, generally speaking, the ATIS will tell you that you need to report your stand or the gate number where you're parked, your aircraft type. Uh, certainly the ATIS designated, that's pretty universal. And in the UK, generally the QNH uh, that you've retrieved from the ATIS, it's part of a mandatory readback for that. Um, so here's an example of that. Um, Heathrow delivery, Speedbird 115 Heavy, more on that in a second. Stand 544, type 787, information Golf, QNH 1023, clearance to Boston. So you see we've got all of that information in there. Um, 
Another option is that you can use if your aircraft is so equipped or if you've got uh, easy CPDLC or something like that, you can use the Hoppy network to request your clearance over PDC. Many controllers will have it up and running, especially if you cross the pond. It's a really great way to help relieve some of the congestion of uh, millions of people requesting clearance all at once. My little asterisk there over a Speedbird 115 Heavy is that uh, outside of the US, uh, if you're flying a an aircraft in the heavy wake turbulence category, you only need to append uh, heavy to your call sign on initial contact with an ATC unit. After that, uh, you don't need to, unlike in the US where you'd uh, give it on every transmission. We get to say heavy over and over again in the US. <laughs> yeah, heavy, 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 heavy. <laughs> so, um, so on the subject of uh, CPDLC, I mentioned it just there. Uh, many facilities within Europe use it, uh, not so much within that USA. Some aircraft, FS Labs, the Phoenix, Ine Builds, uh, others, I think it's just gotten into the Horizon 787 as well very recently. Um, it's a great uh, system. Uh, if not, you can use uh, EPC CPDLC. Uh, which is a standalone uh, piece of software. There's a link there on the page. I'm sure Evan will put a link that you can click more easily somewhere as well. Uh, it's a really simple, easy to use piece of software. Uh, quick example of how that works in terms of uh, getting your um, clearance. Uh, the logon call sign, the hoppy logon call sign you need to send your clearance request in will often be in the uh, controller's uh, ATIS, uh, it's all controller information. So we found that CCRI, uh, that's the information we need to put in. So we go to our ATC tab in Easy CPDLC. We change the recipient to where we want it, CCRI, that we got out of the uh, controller information. Uh, we make sure all our information in here is correct. If you've connected it to SimBrief and to, to, to VATSIM, Easy CPLC will pull all this information down for you. Some of it can't pull down, like the stand number of the ATIS. So you need to fill that in manually. We send it off, uh, off it goes. It chung, chunders around for a minute. Uh, the controller will review it. Um, and we see that uh, a confirmation that that request has been received and is being processed and then we get the clearance there which you can see in text format so it's really nice and straightforward the the information is there in text you don't need to worry about trying to listen for it you do have to respond through the system so you see we click uh will uh, accept it'll send it uh, off back to the controller who will see that you've accepted the clearance we get a message back confirming that and we're good to go. We've got our clearance. We just need to run to set our squawk. So uh, on the subject of briefing the departure, so uh, some things on there that you might want to think about when you are planning and uh, preparing. Um, a really good piece of advice that I had from a friend of mine who was a very senior training captain at a big airline. He said, you should be the world expert in the departure procedure, approach procedure, whatever it is, the instrument procedure that you're about to fly. Nobody else should know more about it uh, than you. Um, and what is the purpose of this kind of departure briefing? Well, we want to spend a little bit of time on the ground where our workload is low. We're not got our hands full of aeroplane uh, taxing around or trying to fly the aircraft to try and build our understanding of the departure we're about to fly, build up our situation awareness and uh, Think about how we're going to fly the departure. And if you take anything away from this, it would be if you're briefing something, try and think about how rather than what. So, um, for example, uh, you know, don't just sort of look at the chart and read through and go, okay, so we're going to climb straight ahead to this waypoint. Then we're going to turn right and we climb to 6,000 feet and we can do this and do that. Yeah. Um, think about how you're actually going to achieve that. Do you need to, what buttons are you going to press? Do you actually need, do you need to do anything out of the ordinary in order to achieve that? Um, you know, think about the, the, say, think about how it is that you're going to actually fly the departure. And when we talk about building situation awareness, one of the things we talk about is sort of building it in blocks. So sort of notice, understand, and think ahead are our three kind of blocks of situation awareness. So, uh, and this is where that sort of thinking about the how rather than the what comes in. So we might think, 
Uh, for example, we might look at the chart and we might see, okay, so we're going to take off, we're going to turn right, it's quite a tight turn, right? So we notice that there's a tight right turn immediately after departure. Uh, and then we might think, okay, so we're going to turn, uh, we've got a tight right turn. It, do we need to, uh, is the airplane going to fly that in at 250 knots or whatever speed it's going to accelerate to, or might it go wide and off of the SID track? If so, uh, what are we going to do? You know, so now we've understood that there, we've noticed the problem, we've understood what might be, you know, what might cause it, and then we can think ahead how are we going to deal with it? Okay, I'm going to manually intervene the speed, I'm going to leave the flaps out for a bit longer until we're round the turn to keep the speed down so the turn is a bit tighter. And you see how we're building that up much more than just talking through the uh, chart, reading off the chart, and just saying, okay, yeah, it looks about right, off, off we go. Now, you remember I mentioned a little bit earlier about the possibility of an initial climb to a flight level, in this case, climbing to flight level six zero. Again, something that you might want to bring up, think about as a threat. What is a, th a threat? It's something that might uh, be out of the ordinary, something that's going to might catch us out. And this is an example of something that can very easily catch people out, especially if the uh, pressure, if the QNH is particularly low. So the question that you need to ask yourself here, if you see uh, something like this, so our initial climb is to a flight level, well, how are we going to deal with that? So in other words, when are we going to set standard pressure? Because if we wait until, uh, you know, until we're at six flight level six zero, um, particularly if the transition altitude, I mean, in this case, the transition altitude is 3000 feet, it might be higher than that it might be 5000 feet at somewhere else. And the stock might be flight level six zero. If we wait until we get to the transition altitude, then set standard, we might, especially if the QNH is very low, we might suddenly find ourselves actually above the uh, cleared level above flight level six zero when we press that standard button. Um, and also, if we press it too close to that cleared level, we get a big jump. Uh, some VNAV systems actually will get really confused, and can't handle it, uh, and will then bust the level as well. So think about when we're going to do that. The conventional thing with a lot of airlines would be that they would set standard at acceleration altitude in this situation. So at 1,000 feet or 1,500 feet, the point at which you start lowering the nose, accelerating and retracting the flaps, you'd also set standard pressure at that point. Something which is really important, though, to mention uh, throughout all of this, so you're going to have a good review of the charts, the taxi for, taxi routing that you expect, where you're parked, where you're going to, the active runway. So think about how we're going to fly the departure. The other thing you can bring in there as uh Evan has mentioned, as, as uh, Rob, I know, will mention in his presentation as well, and, and Ben as well, do have a look at the pilot briefs that are provided for the airports, uh, the cross upon pilot briefs, loads of really good information in there, and they may have some little gems, little nuggets of information about specific procedures at those airports that you'll find really useful. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, quick chat through the climb instructions. Uh, so the type of sort of instructions you might get. Uh, so climb via the SID to flight level 130. What do we mean? Uh, it means that we're going to meet all of the published altitude and speed restrictions on the SID, not exceed flight level 130 until further advised by ATC. So we're going to do exactly what's on the chart. Might also get climb to flight level 130. Now, by default, uh, in most places, you should meet all the amplitude and speed restrictions on the SID, but not exceed flight level 130 until further advised by ATC. The difference is we are different in the UK. Um, climb restrictions override the, override the SID. So you might hear climb now or just climb, but in any case, it overrides any restrictions. You just go straight to flight level 130. Descend via the star, uh, sorry, um, so climb unrestricted to flight level 130. Again, we're just going to ignore all of the charted altitude and, and speeds just straight to 130. Quick chat about pushback and taxi. Um, so uh, we're going to report when we're ready for pushback and engine start on the clearance delivery frequency. And the really important thing to take away here is that we're not going to switch the frequency to the ground frequency until we're instructed to do so. The reason for that is the is the job of the delivery controller, as much as anything, is to organize the flow of aircraft onto the ground controller's frequency and to 
um, make sure that uh, there's not sort of a big pile up and big traffic jam on the ground. So they will make sure that uh, aircraft are released across and pushing back when basically when there's uh, room for them to do so. If you just change over the ground uh, by yourself and start requesting pushback, uh, you're just going to clog the whole system up. If you're asked to stand by, the response to stand by is uh, nothing. We're just going to wait until ATC call us again. Um, it's going to be busy out there. If in doubt, do ask. A um, couple of options you might get, uh, particularly when you're being handed over to the tower controller on your taxi out as you're approaching the runway, you might get contact, in which case you should call with your call sign and where you are, roughly on the airfield, the taxiway, the holding point, whatever. You might get contact with call sign hour only, in which case do what it says on the tin. Just uh, change the new frequency, say your call sign, you've checked in, wait for them to call you back. Finally, you might get monitor or standby for such and such tower on 118.5. In this case, we're going to switch to the frequency, but say nothing. Wait, for, don't call us, we'll call you. Um, altitude changes. Uh, so we mentioned about needing to be at your um, uh, cross the pond slot level by the time you get to uh, the oceanic entry point. That notwithstanding, Anytime you want to change level, you require an ATC clearance, whether your FMS says the step climb, if your optimum flight level changes, if your cleared level on the oceanic clearance is different to your current level, if you hit your top of descent, if you catch jumps on the keyboard, whatever it might be, make sure that you request ATC clearance first before you initiate that level change. And don't expect to get it over the ocean because it is going to be very busy and uh, the tracks will have been planned with that in mind, that uh, level that you were uh, that you were that you've got for your cross the pond slot level. So that is a quick whistle stop tour of departure procedures out of Europe and the UK. Uh, very similar for Africa uh, and uh, other parts of, of, of the world that are ICAO. Uh, it'll sort of broadly follow the same principles that we've talked about here. So that's it from me. And I'm going to hand over now to Ben, who will take you through the oceanic portion of the flight. OK, well, thank you very much, Simon. So, yeah, I'm here to uh, quickly discuss some of the oceanic procedures for, uh, for across the pond. Uh, and just how they kind of differ to define domestically. And so a quick overview here on the first side. We'll get right into it though with uh, the oceanic facilities. Here's a, a map uh, showing all the oceanic airspace. Um, so in the Western Western Hemisphere there. Um, and quite a few places on here that you may not be used to seeing on Bat Sim. And that's really a great part across the pond is that you get to experience some of these uh, some of these sectors that you may never um, you may never get to fly through with controllers. So touching very quickly on lats long waypoints. So um, these are very common across the ocean where you're flying for sort of long, long distances uh, across you know, very empty airspace. Um, rather than defining uh, lots of named waypoints, we would just use uh, simple coordinates. Um, but one thing you should really be familiar with before flying across the pond is how to insert those coordinates into your um, aircraft. So your FMC or your MCDU. Um, the, the reason I bring this up is that each FMC tends to handle this a little bit differently. There's various formats, uh, and so it's very important that you, you know what the format is for your aircraft. So if you're used to flying Boeing and you switch to Airbus, you may struggle, and, and vice versa. Um, so you know, generally, a quick Google search will point you in the right direction. Um, and, and there are also some sort of shorthand uh, formats to entering these uh, coordinates, uh, as you can see at the bottom of the screen there. Uh, on the subject of half degree waypoints, so uh, the, these are waypoints that are, as the name might suggest, uh, half degrees of, of um, longitude. And so, uh, you know, as the te uh, text explains, uh, enables more efficient use of oceanic airspace, but it allows the tracks to be closer together, um, actually, which is helpful, uh, but it does make, make them more finicky to sort of insert into your FMC. So uh, I know a lot of operators in the real world actually forbid manual entry of these waypoints because they are so easy to mess up. Um, really, the um, 
that the best piece of advice I can give uh, to anyone flying across the pond is uh, use SimBrief. Uh, you know, check your your route matches what you've been provided with your slot, your CTP slot, um, and then wherever possible, try and use a uh, an uplink feature from SimBrief to your uh, to your aircraft. Obviously, a lot of aircraft add-ons now simulate this, and it makes your life much much easier. Moving on to cell call or cell call, I do not know for the life of me still what the, the, the correct way to pronounce this is. So if you have a controller on Saturday which switches between the two, that'll probably be me. Um, but but cell call it operates very similar to a, a dial tone um, on, on an old phone. So um, th those of you who have flown on, on CTP before or across the ocean before, uh, you'll know that HF radio has a lot of background static and that's just to how to uh, due, due to how the radio signal sort of degrades as it bounces off the atmosphere, I believe. Um, but it gets quite fatiguing to listen to for you know six hours at a time. Uh, and so the way that they get around this is um, the aircraft will have a a, a four letter code, um, and it will listen out for its code being played over the the frequency. Um, and when it when it hears its code, it sets off a, a sort of chime in the cockpit. Uh, and it's simulated and advanced, which is really handy. Um, the the important point here is that you need to use the four letter code that's assigned to you uh, through the VATS in booking system. If you have two pilots using the same code, um, the system just won't work for for that particular code. And you might think, oh, you know, what what are the odds of that? You know, however many uh, codes there are, I don't know how many letters there. There are, I'm sure, Simon, you, you, I think you probably know, don't you? Uh, there is a limited number. It's a problem in real life as well. So basically, you'd get both uh, aircraft pinging at the same time. So in reality, what they do is they try and assign, because they do have to reuse the codes, but they try and assign them to aircraft that are not likely to come together at the same time. So on different sides of the world kind of thing. Right, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So I know my my component product isn't great, but the, yeah, there's a, a a finite number. But again, you you might think you know what the chances of that on Batsim actually much higher than in real life because on Batsim we all tend to use uh, the same liveries, right? And so you go into your aircraft, you look at the little placard in the cockpit, and you go, oh, there's my there's my code. Um, so you know, ten people flying on the same livery um, from uh, from or the, the same funny word that you've made of the letter. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so so yeah it happens quite frequently um so yeah that's why we assign you um sound call codes for ctp and it's very important that you do try and use those uh oh yeah, and just a final point there um you still have to be tuned to the hf radio frequency to receive those pings uh, but you can turn the volume right down just ensure you don't mute v pilot or x pilot because the sound call chime will often come through your power client so you will not hear it if you mute it and give you a tip on how to do that at the end yeah that'd be great because i've not actually figured that out myself yet so that would that'd be really handy um so so very quickly then we'll, we'll sort of skim through oceanic clearances um, and how we go about requesting these because again this is something which if you've not flown for ctp before or you've just not been lucky enough to get atc across the ocean before um it'll be completely new to you um and so a lot of you will know, you know, flying across the ocean is very different because there's no radar. So to, to get around this, uh, and certainly in the olden days before we have sort of ADSB and, and satellites, um, it would be completely um, manual, right? You, you, you have absolutely no um, sort of satellite ping or radar ping of that aircraft until they reach the other side of the ocean. And, and so the clearance is really very, very important because um, you're effectively, or air traffic control effectively prescribes you a, a route, a speed, and an altitude to fly, and that will guarantee that you remain clear of, of conflict for your entire crossing, uh, which is quite impressive, really. You know, I think a four, five, six hour crossing, um, and they have to do that for hundreds of planes at a time, it's quite a feat. But um, it's very important that you provide the right information um, and stick to that clearance. But uh, we'll run through what sort of information you will need. Right. So, firstly, uh, routing, again provided through your CTP booking. So, you should be hopefully familiar with this, uh, but before you uh, request your clearance, it shouldn't come as news to you uh, at the time of 
flying across Ireland or Scotland, uh, that, that you are, your routing is is miles off tro- off course. But uh, you are you need you know NAT track or random routing, so that again will be provided in your uh, CTP booking. The NAT tracks that we use for CTP are usually fictional, so I, I think some years in the past we we started from the other other end of the alphabet, so. Uh, generally speaking, westbound tracks start at alpha and then work down through the alphabet. Eastbound tracks uh, start at Zulu and move the other way backwards to the alphabet. Um, so I think for, for westbound, we um, start at Zulu, so they're, they're not in use with the wheel world, just to avoid any sort of confusion there. Um, but you need your NAT track identifier provided with your booking. Uh, your estimated time of arrival for your oceanic entry point, so that's the point at which uh, you went to oceanic airspace marked on your flight plan, and it's the first point um, within that NAT track as well is your oceanic entry point. Um, again, a quick note there, make sure you're using um, real-world time in your flight sim just so that your FMC is providing um, estimated time uh, in, in correct UTC or Zulu time. Um, if you set your sim time to something else than UTC, then you will have to sort of manually convert those times to UTC, and it gets gets quite tedious and e- easy to make mistakes there. Of course, you need We're a simple yeah. people pilot. Yes, yeah. Well, certainly for me, I, I, I'm I struggle to do math, so math, keep sorry. things simple. <laughs> yeah, keep things simple and uh, just stick with UTC, right? Um, your your level is your prescribed flight level um again as part of your booking again oops sorry one minute just with that sorry with um with your, with your level you, you're assigned a level let's say flight level 370 just ensure that you don't load up with uh you know 15 hours worth of fuel and maximum payload you won't be able to make it up there so again just make sure that you are able to actually achieve that level by the oceanic entry point um, otherwise, you will uh, run, into, run into difficulty there. And of course, finally, your requested Mac number for Oceanic Crossing. This can be whatever you want, really. Um, you know, generally, um, Simbrief will fix this for you, and it will ra- it'll be around about um, your your sort of economical cruise uh, speed, so your, your cost index cruise. It'll be around about that. So um, you shouldn't be a, a huge deviation from what you're flying before the ocean. And here we have just again some examples of what you get that information from. So uh, number two here, you can see your estimated time uh, of arrival at Mallets. Number five is your your current um, MAC number for uh, in, in the cruise, um, which again you would use that that'll be your requested speed, and then your recommended max as well on on the uh, on the third picture down or the third from the. The third, the third, how my brain would would read that as a third, but it's actually marked four. Um, that is, uh, that that is your recommended maximum flight level. Again, will differ between aircraft, um, but you know, you should generally know where to find those uh, bits of information. Now, in the olden days, uh, of course, you would call up a a controller, um, a a Shalmik, um delivery controller or clearance delivery officer, I think they're called. Um, that was um, great, for, great for, for CTP for many years, but then it got extremely busy and um, it became incredibly difficult to actually get that clearance before you uh, entered the ocean. So um, we now push everyone to use um, to NAT track, to, sorry, to use NAT track. Um, and in fact, it's, it's actually mandatory um, that all pilots use this uh, this website. And it's really quite simple. So uh, between 30 and 60 minutes before you enter Oceanic Airspace, um, you will fill out this form. Um, as you can see here, you just put in all the information. Some will be pre-populated for you. Uh, your call sign, your destination, I think. Things like that are already pre-populated. Um, and this is what you get back. So um, it's your clearance uh, message. Again, where you're cleared to, your, your NATs, it, gives you the full um, NAT track expanded routing for you to cross check against your FMC. Uh, then you have here from Tobor, time uh, 1212, uh, maintain flight level 360, MAC decimal 82. You then have a uh, restriction on your um, on your clearance. So in this case, we're told not to cross Tobor between, uh, before 12.10 Zulu. 
and it's informed us that ATC has changed um, our Mac number from our requested Mac, um, and they've also changed our flight level from our requested flight level. And it's all spelled out very handily in plain English uh, below that big long message, um, so it's quite easy to follow there. Okay, big green box in, in bold text. Um, I suppose the golden rule really advance him. If you don't understand something, it's just to ask. Um, so if you're having problems with that track, if you don't understand the clearance, if you haven't received your clearance, um, if you're unable to comply with your clearance for whatever reason, um, talk to your current domestic controller. Um, even though they might not be able to solve that problem themselves, remember they will be quite busy, um, they might just tell you to go and, and speak to a clearance delivery controller um, via VHF. That's fine, but what you can't do is go sort of walk about changing frequencies, calling up Shamit controllers, calling up clearance delivery controllers, um, because the domestic controller will inevitably call you up and you won't be there, and it, it becomes a, a real problem. So then, uh, entering oceanic airspace, uh, in terms of things you have to do, uh, it's, it's generally quite similar nowadays to, to flying. Um, under radar control because we have uh, ADSB sort of satellites, we can still sort of keep an eye on you. Um, the, the the main difference is um, initiating a, a sound call check. Um, as you can see here, a sort of example. So I don't know uh, if Simon or Rob want to pretend to be the pilot here, and I can pretend to be a controller for a day. That would be uh, be quite helpful. But I don't know if Simon, if you want to go ahead, do you want to be the heavy virgin today? You can go ahead. Sure, why not, Kelvin? <laughs> Uh, so, uh, it's going to be uh, Shanwick Radio, Shanwick Radio, Virgin 127, Heavy Gander Next, request cell call check, Alpha Juliet Echo Sierra. Uh, and, and me as a, a very experienced uh, Shanwick controller, of course, I would reply Virgin 127, Shanwick Radio, Roger, stand by for cell call check. Um, and then hopefully in a couple of seconds, uh, someone should hear a ding dong, um, which would indicate um and i would come back and say uh Shanwick virgin 127 sound call check okay perfect uh, and that's what you have to do really um again it's good practice to do that every time you switch frequency so typically that's at 30 west you would switch frequency and you request a new sound call check um again that's just to make sure it's working um, with each control you talk to it should always work on VATSIM because it uses the same system um and that's really it. Squawk 2000, 30 minutes after entering oceanic airspace, purely because you're you're no longer um, you're you're you know you're not being picked up by radar, so your your mode A mode C data is useless. Uh, so you can set the squawk to 2000, and then it's not set to a random squawk when you end up on the US side. Um, there was something called conditional frequency changes, which uh, are sometimes used uh, during day to day operations. I would suspect they won't be used on, uh, on, on CTP purely because we tend to have issues with pilots not following the uh, the instructions. Um, often because, again, pilots haven't heard of it before. Um, often because pilots are too busy watching Netflix. But effectively what this uh, is... Um, and again, or the, the Taylor <laughs> Swift or whatever. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, There's no judgment here, but uh, whatever the reason, uh, pilots tend to get... Uh, t tend to forget let's say, to, to call the next frequency. And, and so the way it works, and this is generally how it works in the real world, is you're, you're told a 30 west contact to kind of radio 131.575. So when you pass uh, the waypoint at 30 west, so it could be uh, 57 north, 030 west in your FMC, once you pass that waypoint, you would then change frequency and you would check in with the radio in the same way we just did with Shamwick. So you would request, request a sound count track effectively. Um, like I say, not sim not always simulated a bat sim. I suspect it won't be for CTP, but if you hear this from a controller, that's what it means. Uh, quite simple, whether you know what it is, but uh, again, that's half the battle. Okay, uh, I think we're getting towards the end now, but uh, so I I'll spare you uh, I'll spare you a bit of time here. Uh, operations without an assigned fixed speed, um, quite common in I don't know New York oceanic users. Um, I don't know elsewhere, if I'm honest, but uh, what effectively uh, this allows you to do is disregard the um, speed portion of your oceanic clearance. So if you're told to assume normal speed, you can go into your FMC and select uh, econ speed and uh, manage the speed, whatever whatever your 
uh, flavor of aircraft uh, as you're flying, um, you, you're able to fly whatever speed you want. Um, if you don't hear this, you have to maintain that assigned fixed speed all the way until you enter domestic airspace. Uh, always says here, Santa Maria, New York, Oceanic. Um, so that's where you would hear this most, most commonly. So that's all for me. Um, I'll hand you over to, uh, to Rob now, who will take you through some of the arrival procedures in America. All right. Very good, guys. Thank you, uh, Ben. Thank you, Simon. Uh, we're going to take you through uh, three parts here in talking about uh, arrivals into the Americas. We're going to talk about descent prep. We're going to talk about the different variations of, of types of descent instructions you're going to receive. And we're going to talk about preparing for your approach and landing. Now, one thing I will mention is that we are, we do have a few arrival airports that are outside of the Americas. We have a couple that are in um, South America, one or, one or more that's in South America, one or more that's in the Caribbean. So the phraseology that you're going to hear in those locations is more like ICAO standard worldwide. It's uh, Americas, we, especially the U.S., but we tend to do things a little bit differently. But uh, um, the, the, what I'm going to cover is somewhat applicable to those locations, but it's mostly applicable to uh, North America, U.S., and Canada. So let's start by talking about uh, descent preparation. We always say that a good landing starts with a good approach. Well, the good approach starts with a good briefing. So what's that even mean? It means that you need to plan out what's going to happen before you execute that plan. You should stay ahead of the airplane. Uh, number one, you want to check the ATIS. You can do this via text through your pilot client. You don't even need to be in range of it to do that. You can cheat. You can type dot ATIS and then a space and then the name of the ATIS station. But at the very latest, you want to check before you reach your top of descent. The ATIS is going to tell you which approach and landing runway to expect, but it also, there may be several landing runways in use. One thing to point out is the center controller generally does not know which approach and runway you're gonna get. They, they may know that the airport's landing eastbound and the, the airport's landing westbound or what have you, but there's if there are several runways in use, it's, it's useless to ask center. Uh, you'll get that information from uh, when you get handed off from center to approach on the way down. Now, the star might have different transitions depending on which runway or landing direction they are using. In that case, the center will have at least that information to provide you with your descent instruction. Uh, but it's uh, incumbent upon the pilot to make sure that the correct set of points for that transition have imported. So you'll need to verify the altitude and speed restrictions are, are along the path are all in your FMC, but it's also the correct um, the correct string of points, in other words. Uh, in this case, we're looking at uh, CLEB. We want to make sure it says 8,250 knots, and then HOCDU at 5,210 knots. And you can see that they are both indeed in there the way they are supposed to be. Um, for the approach, the key figures you want to keep in mind are the nav radio frequencies, if, if applicable, if it's, a, if it's a radio, it's a conventionally navigated approach, uh, and the course, and then the minimums are, are what you're going to want to look at. For your landing, good to know which way you're vacating off the runway and uh, kind of get a sense of where you're going after that. So you might not know your specific parking location. And, and, and keep in mind, in the U.S., uh, we're generally going to ask you where you would like to park. We're not going to assign a stand, which is uh, the way it's done commonly uh, on the east side of the pond. But in the U.S., you know, we'll, we'll say uh, Southwest 123, where are you parking today? So uh, if you don't have a specific gate in mind, that's fine. You can just say Terminal 4 or whatever. Uh, or even just, hey, wherever's close. I, I've been in the the cockpit for seven hours. Just wherever's closest is fine. Just have something in mind as far as which way you're going to go, but at least know which way you're vacating the runway to go toward the passenger terminal. All right. Um, the descent instructions in the U.S. and Canada, they differ from each other slightly in the, the, the format and the philosophy with respect to the um, what, whether they cancel or, or override the restrictions. So let's kind of go over that real quick. Uh, this is uh, the, our first example that's based on uh, Canadian phraseology. And in this example, the, the, the phrase is descend 1-1000. So first of all, that means start descending now. Don't wait until your top of descent. You've just gotten instruction. You need to descend. If you're before your top of descent, best thing to do is set maybe a 1,000 foot per minute descent until the vertical path then catches up with you. And then you can put it back in the VNAV and let the plane uh, kind of take its own way down. But you do need to start that descent now if that's what you were told to do. Uh, the second thing is you want to keep in mind that the crossing restrictions here at Lyrit 
and the speed restriction at Lyrit do still apply. And then third, you got to reach uh, 11,000 by Dunop because that is what's indicated here on the chart. It wasn't in the, ver the verbal instruction, but it is on the chart. Second example, when ready, descend 1, 1,000. Now, this is where you can generally go by what's in your FMC as your calculated top of the set, vertical nav mode or whatever your particular aircraft calls it. So it means you can start down when you want to, which is generally when your FMC says your top of the scent is, uh, but the charted altitudes and speeds do still apply and you got to be at Dunop by 11,000 or 11,000 by Dunop rather. Okay, now in this example, your cross your instruction is cross Dunop at 10,000. This is indeed a descent instruction, assuming that you're higher than 10,000 right now. Um, this is a little bit tricky. You do still need to meet the altitude and speed restrictions at Lyrit, but to reach 10,000, not 11 by the time you get to Dunup. So the controller has overridden the altitude restriction at Dunup, but the restrictions at Lyrit still count. And then finally, descend unrestricted 8,000. This is how a, uh, an instruction will sound in Canada if they don't want you to keep to the charted restrictions. Unrestricted means disregard all the restrictions. Just proceed directly to 8,000. Don't pass go. Don't collect $200. Um, this in your aircraft might be a vertical speed mode or a flight level change or some other mode other than the managed or VNAV or whatever you call it, because you want it to ignore all the restrictions that are in the FMC. You basically, you take all those restrictions, you chuck them out the window, and then you raise those restrictions down to 8,000 feet. Now, by comparison, in the US, if they want you to follow the series of constraints along a star, they will literally tell you that, descend via the blank, blank arrival. So before all this happens, you'll want to have verified all those correct points and all those restrictions are present in your FMC, as we covered a couple slides ago. But it also means that you can start down at your calculated top of the scent. It's the same thing as saying at pilot's discretion or when ready. But you do need to make sure you hit all the constraints along the way. So you are responsible as the pilot in command of that aircraft, not the FMC, the pilot is. So your job is to monitor and, and, and make sure that the FMC is meeting all these restrictions. You might have to add some drag as necessary to uh, ensure that that's the case. Don't think um, the, that the FMC has ever had uh, a letter from the FAA. <laughs> for yeah, exactly. No, that, that, that tends to come addressed to the pilot typically. Um, you want to lower that uh, mode control panel altitude to the lowest published constraint on the arrival, not below. So in this case, descend via the blank blank arrival means, what, based on what's on the screen, the lowest you can set that altitude on your um, your mode control panel is 6,000 because you, you, you can't go by what's on the approaches. You haven't been cleared for the approach yet. You've been cleared to descend via the arrival. The approach comes later. Those altitudes come later. You can't do that yet. Uh, next, we're going to talk about the uh, the way an, a U.S. instruction will override um, constraints. So in this example, we're going to say descend and maintain 1-1000. Unlike in other places, a descend and maintain in the U.S. does mean disregard all the altitude restrictions. However, it does not mean that you can disregard the speed restrictions. The speed restrictions here do still apply. And then you, just, you get a new one that's called Descend Pilot's Discretion 1-1000. That is, again, it cancels all the altitude restrictions, but it does mean you can start down when you want to, i.e. when your FMC tells you to. Again, though, the speed restriction is still there at Ocean. So, so the Descend clearance changes what you've cleared to altitude-wise, but unless you're told specifically, it doesn't change anything that you've been cleared to do speed wise so i guess you have to think of it that way modifying the altitude restriction doesn't modify the speed restriction so um now side note the speed restriction of 250 knots at ocean uh you might think oh well i gotta be at 250 below 10,000 feet anyway so it's why do you even put that on the chart but notice that it's it's 250 uh, above and below meaning not 250 or below it means you have to maintain 250 knots exactly from ocean on until you're told otherwise All right, here's an interesting one that we hear sometimes in the U.S. cross blank waypoint and and at and maintain a certain altitude. It's kind of equivalent to descend pilot's discretion, um, but it just means that you need to make it by make it to that altitude by that waypoint. Um, and again, 
Uh, you can disregard all the other aptitudes, but you got to keep the speed restriction, like I've said already a couple of times. Um, U.S. star charts have a couple different sets of altitudes on them. Um, U.S. and Canadian star charts have them in slightly different formats. So we're going to kind of compare and contrast here. This is uh, the, an example of the ragged star into Toronto. You can see at this point, Kevno, that you need to be at exactly 8,000 feet, exactly 210 knots. This is uh, a snip from the ocean arrival into Boston. So now we're on the U.S. side. And in these FAA charts, you'll see that there are points restrictions, meaning the, the altitude that you need to be at that point. And then we've got these um, other altitudes that tend to confuse pilots. Like, oh, I need to descend down below 13, 15,000. No. For all intents and purposes, ignore those sideways ones along the segment. They're important, but they're not important for this purpose. For, for this purpose, just go by the ones that are listed at each uh, point. And then finally, this is a, a little bit of a different one. This is the departure arrival into Kennedy. And this is where you're going to have an expected altitude and not an assigned altitude. So you will not hear, in this case, descend via the parch arrival because there are no altitudes associated with that arrival. The expected altitude is expected, but it's not assigned. So they will give you the crossing restriction cross Calverton at and maintain 12,000. That's when you've been assigned this altitude. It is, by the way, it's a good idea to punch this expected altitude into your FMC for planning purposes because that will back calculate the top of descent that you'll need to hit in order to make it to Calverton by 12,000. Um, but you just have to understand you haven't actually been assigned that yet, and it may vary by you might you might get 13, you might get 11, depending on operational needs at the time. But at least you only be off by a thousand. The top of the set at least will be in the bright ballpark. At the end of the star, this is super, super important. You, you must know what to do when you get to the end of the star, because this is a, a, something that Datsun pilots tend to uh, misinterpret or, 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 or get wrong quite often. Um, what you need to do at the end of the star is generally not automatically turn onto the approach without having been cleared to. And that's what a lot of Datsun pilots do, because what they've done is they've closed up all these discontinuities. We'll talk about that in a moment. In this example, it says expect radar vectors to final approach course after LaGuardia VOR. Now, sometimes you might get that heading before you get to LaGuardia. So even though you're expecting it after, they're now telling you fly heading 170 vectors to final. That means go ahead and do that now. That doesn't mean wait until after. If they want you to turn after LaGuardia, they'll say depart LaGuardia VOR heading 170 vectors for the approach. That's not what's depicted on this slide right now. All right, when they're breaking you, when they're giving you that heading prior to the end of the star, they're breaking you off of the star. They're starting to work you in toward the approach. So just understand the difference. Um, if you see an instruction that says, then on track, note that the last instruction is uh, Joby at 6,210 knots, then on track 213 degrees, expect radar vectors. That does not mean you can connect Joe B with the first point on your approach. This dotted green line past Joe B, you just stay straight on to a morning, Peter Pan. <laughs> then, um, then when you when you delete that discontinuity or what have you, you're telling the FMC to connect Joe B with the approach, and you haven't, in this case, been cleared to do that yet. You need to just stay straight on, wait until they clear you to turn, then you can join the approach. So do whatever it takes. And whether you put the plane in heading mode or you just leave that vector leg as it is, whatever, you just need to make sure that when you get to the end of the star, you're following the instruction that's on the chart and not just letting the FMC turn the plane for you. Okay. Uh, real quick example from the banker to arrival into Charlotte. This is basically the same case uh, that, I'm, that I've just described. So you're landing on the 18s in Charlotte, then after this point, Jordan or Jordan on the banker, um, it says stay on a course of 003. The key phrase again, expect radar vectors. The FMC is showing you a warning here about a root discontinuity. In some cases, it'll say vector leg. Uh, root discontinuity is the other one. There's a tendency among VATS and pilots, I think a lot of tutorials that, you know, that, are, that are done by people that are not simulated pilots that are not on a multiplayer network. They'll tell you to punch in the arrival, the, the departure, punch in your en route segment, punch in your arrival, and then just delete all the discontinuities and especially your, to your approach. 
that works if you're flying in an empty sky or an AI populated sky. It doesn't work on a multiplayer network. You, you, you might be tempted to connect this point Jordan with this point Caddy, um, which is the first point on the ILS to 18 left, but uh, you leave the plane in LNAV mode. It is literally going to just turn right onto the localizer. You're going to tell the, the controller is going to ask you, why are you turning? And you're going to say, my FMC is messing up. Well, no, it's not messing up. It's doing exactly what you told it to do. Don't tell it to connect those points. All right, real quick, I'm going to finish with a checklist for flying across the pond. Um, the, the big one is read the pilot briefings for your origin and your destination. There's also a briefing for oceanic airspace. So when you get onto the ctp.vatsim.net website and you see your um, your route, that your slot that you've been confirmed for, you'll get your route, you'll get your cell cal code there as well. I think that was one of the questions in the, the uh, Q&A. Um, but the pilot briefings for your origin, the oceanic and destination will be on that site as well. Um, there are probably in those briefings some recommendations for scenery and uh, you want to, you know, then they might have some freeware options and some payware options. You definitely want to try and get updated scenery so that your layout and your sim matches what's on the charts as closely as possible. Um, nav data, I'm going to back up a step. Nav data, very important. The next AirX cycle update is when? It's tomorrow. <laughs> so uh, those of you who uh, are flying this event, you probably want to go ahead and update that navigation data tomorrow. It's AirX cycle 2404, I believe, is going to be the current one. So make sure you grab that if you got the opportunity. Your route will be posted uh, generally the night before. So again, that's ctp.vatsim.net website. Log on to that. Um, look that route over and make sure you have all the charts you need if you have a navigraph subscription great because you have all the charts globally worldwide wide if not go ahead and look through those and look at chart fox possibly has them if you need to google the aip for whatever country you're flying into and out of and see if the charts are available there whatever go through the night before make sure you figure out where to find those charts don't be fumbling around for them when they're giving you your taxi instructions Bring extra fuel. Um, this is an event that does tend to get backed up sometimes in terms of air traffic or ground traffic. Um, if you're planning uh, your origin to destination plus a 45 minute reserve, yeah, you might wanna add a little bit to that. Uh, speaking of 45 minutes, a common question is when should I, how soon should I connect before my slot time? We'll tell you about 45 minutes before your, your CTOT, which is your takeoff, calculated takeoff time is what that stands for, CTOT. Plan to connect about 45 minutes before that. Plan to push about 20 minutes before that. However, those pilot briefings that I mentioned at the top of the slide might tell you different guidelines, especially if it's a very large airport like uh, Amsterdam. Um, so go by what's in, in those guides, but these are just some general guidelines uh, for planning purposes. Um, if you can't get through to a controller because the frequency is too busy, don't try to jump in via chat or direct message. Everyone's in the same boat. Everyone's got the same priority. Everyone wants to get out. Everyone's, oh my God, my slot time's coming up. I have to go. Just take a deep breath. The controller will get to you as soon as they can. Just jump in when there's a, a gap in the in the frequency like everyone else. The, the texting and stuff, you're trying to jump the line in that case. Don't. Just just do, you know, just just keep on the frequency like everyone else. Uh, and then keep the distractions to a minimum during those critical times, especially, you know, they always say sterile cockpit below 10,000 is kind of the common rule. Not a bad uh, day to institute that in your own uh, simulated cockpit as well. We always say try not to be that guy or that person with um, special requests, lengthy radio transmissions, keep everything concise. Your job on Cross the Pond as a pilot is to do what everyone else is doing. Don't be the special guy. Oh, I'm going to go non-RNAV today. I'm going to fly a 1960s jet uh, when everyone's doing you know, modern RNAV and modern airspace. This is not the day to be different, guys. This is not the day to be special. This is not the day to require the controller to do more for you than they're doing for anybody else. But the one thing you do want to do is ask questions if you, if you didn't quite catch something. It takes the controller less time to re-explain or repeat than it does to fix an issue that you caused because you didn't follow your instruction. So be that guy in that case if you didn't understand something, but don't be the guy that's asking for you know something unusual. This isn't the day for it. I'm gonna leave you with a uh, list of some resources here. Um, some uh, the pilot briefings, as we mentioned, there's some other 
places that you can go for some uh, knowledge base type stuff. But uh, I'm going to go ahead and turn it back over to our host, Evan. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Rob, and to all three of you for the great presentation. I'm going to stay off the camera here because I'm circling between several different screens, try to make sure we capture everyone's questions. And I will go through those questions more or less in the same order that you just heard everything. So we'll start with kind of the general questions. Then we'll talk about departures, oceanic, and final arrivals. If you do have more questions, please post them wherever you're watching in whichever chat you have in front of you and it's my job to go find those dig them out and ask them to everyone who's here with me on the stream i just want to do one quick reminder on the slots if you do not have a booking you did not get one already the magic time to know about is tomorrow april the 18th at 1700 zulu somewhere around there probably within a two or three hour window of there there will be a drop of any slots that haven't been confirmed yet. And so if you're looking for a booking, that's the time to go back to the Cross the Pond website and find it. And if you keep an eye on the Cross the Pond Discord tomorrow, probably you will see something about it. But 1700 Zulu, I would be uh, hitting the F5 button on the Cross the Pond website. And if there's anything that comes available, that's probably when it will happen. So questions, um, starting off with a couple of general questions. Rob, I'll direct this one to you because you're our Twitch expert here. So if you're a first timer to Vatsim, you know, obviously this really wouldn't be the event for you. Like you're welcome to hang out and jump on the network just don't fly to one of the cross the pond airports on your first day on Vatson probably but if you wanted to watch or participate without actually being the pilot what do you recommend for people to do well first of all i would say if it's your first day on the network you shouldn't be flying in any published event let alone cross the pond uh you want to make those first handful of flights in airspace where there's a controller but very little air traffic but on the cross the pond day if you're looking for some resources as to how to spectate uh you're considering flying in this event next time i would just search the word vatsim on twitch that is going to give you dozens and dozens of uh, of uh, returns uh and if you look in the afternoon you'll see one called slant alpha adventures i'm going to be controlling somewhere around dulles as one of the arrival airports i don't know where yet i'm hoping they give me a uh uh tower or ground position but i don't know yet but if you just search the word vatsim in twitch you're going to see probably 30, 40, 50 returns of, of pilots and controllers working the event. So you'll be able to look at it from lots of different perspectives. Perfect. Thanks for that. And maybe Simon or anyone else who wants to talk about cell cals. We've got a couple of questions about those. So first of all, where can people find their assigned cell cal code? So that uh, will be provided to you as part of your cross the pond booking. Ben, you might know more specifically than that but yeah that will basically be provided to you own it as part of the information that you receive when you book your slot and you get your routes and everything perfect and then yeah the, the, the yeah. ctp website so when you log back onto the ctp website uh your route will be there your cell cat will be there and then where would you actually put that into your airplane or how do you connect that to the network so people you know so it actually works yeah, so uh, you may notice what when you log in uh, uh, through VPilot or, or VaxPilot or whatever it is you, you're, you're using, um, to the right uh, of where you enter your call sign, it will ask for your aircraft type and then uh, often a cell cal, uh, or not often, it will ask for a cell cal uh, code. Now you can leave it blank and it won't complain. Uh, so a lot of people often don't use that, but it is there. Um, just make sure that you are putting the hyphen in there so you should have two letters a hyphen or a dash and then two more letters um and then it should accept uh, accept the code perfect and earlier on i mentioned about uh, how to turn down the radio but still have your cell oh, call yeah. uh code work so essentially when uh, certainly with v pilot i presume with x pilot and the other pilot clients as well the way that it works is that the cell call chime when you get or cell call alert uh, is played through the windows default audio device in fact all yep. of those sounds you know the radio transmission sounds yes. cell call alerts etc come through the whatever you've set as the windows default audio device so the way to do it uh, if you've got a usb headset like this for example uh, is you would set your uh computer speakers uh loudspeakers as the default audio device in windows therefore all of your uh v pilot sounds will come out of the speakers uh and then in v pilot go in and set your headset as your 
radio device. So then your radio transmissions will come in through your headset. The sounds like message alerts and cell call alerts will come out through the loudspeakers. Therefore, when you uh, get your uh, get onto uh, the ocean, you do your cell call check. Um, everything's okay. You can then take off your headset, put it away. You don't have to listen to all the uh, or turn down the volume, whatever. You don't have to listen to all the um, communications and uh, you know the HF stuff. Uh, but you will still get your uh, cell call alert through the loudspeakers uh, as long as they're turned up. Perfect. Christoph and Mark, good questions for the planning team. I have those both written down. I'll take them to them later. Question from Speedbird612 on the Vatsum Twitch. How much extra fuel should I pack? How long's a piece of string? <laughs> how much do you want to get thing. into your... Well, actually, the real question is, how, how much do you want to get into your planned destination airport? Right. Because... Right, because extra fuel is this, this thing, right? Extra fuel uh, gives you options, okay? It gives you the ability to hold a bit longer, absorb more delay. Uh, you could take out, I mean, I wouldn't recommend it, but you could uh, because uh, one of the things is obviously there might be, if everybody does that uh, and you take stuff with just the minimum flight plan fuel, then everybody arrives and everybody's holding, suddenly everybody has to divert. So, you know, but in theory, you could, and then it gets a bit messy, uh, but in theory, you could take off with the minimum flight plan fuel. They say, okay, you're going to have a 45 minute delay. And you say, okay, well, I can't accept that. Therefore, I'd like to divert to somewhere, you know, somewhere else instead. Right. And you could do that. Right. I mean, I wouldn't recommend it, but obviously the more fuel that you uh, have with you, uh, the more options you have, the longer you can hold for, the more likely you are to get into where you want to get in, which really and is where you and your virtual of... passengers want to get. <laughs> Didn't mean to interrupt you, Simon. On the flip no, side ahead, of that, sorry. you can bring five hours extra fuel, but if you're not willing to hold for five additional hours, then there's really no purpose in bringing that much extra fuel. That's a good point. Absolutely. But as a general ballpark, I would say uh, I would probably take at least 45 minutes extra, maybe an hour or so, something like that should keep you comfortable. I could, yeah, uh, I, we, I, and I we could always, go on forever say, uh, about... Go on, sorry. Uh, yeah, alternate reserve and contingencies. So enough to get to a reasonable alternate nearby, a non-event alternate, um, your normal reserve of you know, 45 minutes, hour, whatever you normally plan for, and then your you know your contingencies on top of that. But then I would add just potentially another hour on top of that maybe of holding. And then if you get beyond that hour, then it, you might say at this point, okay, just break me off and divert me to whatever's closest. But it's up to you. I mean, that's that's you, what, you, you set that threshold, not the event. You know what I mean? Yeah. Arch NDA yeah. uh, says when planning for any event, consider the VATS and tax extra fuel. I like that idea. <laughs> that makes a lot of <laughs> sense. A uh, question from Ian about IFR clearances out of Europe, Africa. Will they come through CPDLC or voice or both? Um, either or, really, whatever. So the way that uh, we do uh, PDC, pre departure clearance, and CPDLC stuff. Uh, data link clearance in Europe and uh, I, as far as I know in uh, Africa and places like that as well is that it's very much initiated by the pilot. So if you are logged on to uh, the Hoppy network and you want to use uh, that to request your clearance and the controller has it set up, so you've checked in their controller info and it says, you know, PDC available on EGLL or whatever it might be, uh, then you request it and you'll get it back that way. Uh, you won't get it uh, unsolicited, as it were, through there if you haven't requested it first. So if you, so you can call up via voice, or you can request it through uh, Hoppies. But uh, either way, it's you that determines that, basically. Perfect. I know it wasn't part of the question, but I will, I will sort of add to that for the Oceanic side of things. Um, nothing will come through through Hoppies for the Oceanic um, clearances. That's all done through um, that track is what i was looking for um yeah there's, there's no way of doing it there's no way of, of sort of implementing that within the controller client presently which is why it's all done through nitrack and ben charlie had asked about using cptlc for like a regular climb or descent over the ocean that would also not be possible right it would just be basically nat track you're gonna get your altitude and that's kind of it yeah as i understand it i think there are people looking at using that track um for over the ocean uh, so not 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 that track over the ocean hoppies over the ocean for passing um yeah cpdlc climb descent speed changes etc uh, but certainly not with ctp um 
the, the, the vast majority of controllers that uh, control for CTP will control twice a year for CTP. Um, and so they're just be using uh, the, the CTP controller pack, which becomes bog standard. Um, there's, there's no extra USK plugins to do that. So uh, it will be via voice. Uh, so yeah, keep an eye out for the talc helping. Um, if you don't receive that, um, keep an eye out for contact me to often use in place of uh, sound call pings um, or again, text messages on the frequency. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. And then we had a number of questions just about routes and oceanic clearances. So I have that answer and I'll just share that uh, generally speaking, the route, whether there's an official NAT track or not, what you get emailed to you and what is in the pilot dashboard with your route, those are the waypoints that you want to use. So it really doesn't matter what is the real NAT on the day of or whatever, just like use the route that you're given is the easiest thing to do. And in terms of oceanic clearances, there were some questions about, okay, I'm flying from this airport to that airport. Do I need an oceanic clearance? The answer to that is that all CTP routes will require some form of oceanic clearance, except if you're flying from Casablanca to Fortaleza, I hope I said that somewhat correctly, that's S, B, F, Z, or Z, depending where you are, and the other route is Casablanca to El Dorado. So those two are the only ones that won't go through oceanic airspace as per uh, Kieran, the oceanic expert, I hope. And everything else, no matter where you're going from or to, you will at some point go into the NAT track system and get a clearance through there. So with that in mind, uh, the question from Jack was, can I request oceanic clearance via voice if someone wants to take that one? Um, so, yeah, theoretically, yes, there's nothing stopping you, but we would prefer that, that no one does. You know, if you're having an issue with the website, absolutely fine. If the, if the website goes down, fine. Um, if it's been 10, 15 minutes and you've not heard back um, through the website, fine. Um, but as you can appreciate, if we have 100 controllers calling up, um, five clearance delivery controllers, mm -hmm. um, you know, that that's quite a lot on our process to you know, there's a lot of back and forth there in terms of passing the information, the controller writes it down, they go away and check if they're conflicting clearances and it takes a long time. So yeah, um, wherever possible. It, please, harkens, please it harkens back to what I said. Don't do anything differently than anybody else. Just yeah. just go with the flow. Yeah. Do what everyone is doing. Try not to be unique. CTP yeah, yeah. is not the day to be unique. Yeah, exactly. Oh, so we appreciate it may not be realistic, um, you know, uh, to, to use that track. Yeah, so, you know, certainly in terms of in, in a modern context, it's not that unrealistic, actually, because most of the times nowadays you would request that clearance through ACARS. Um, and so and so um, that NAT track isn't too dissimilar in that regard. We appreciate some pilots might be flying, you know, like a 7.4 Classic or something, and it doesn't have that functionality. Um, but we still ask that you try and just, you know, for, for, for one one or two days a year, just try and use that system, um, if you wouldn't mind. And the reality is if that aircraft was flying in that airspace today, it would be, it would have to have it installed, so. Yeah, or it would just be told to stay below 290 or something ridiculous, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, Simon, question for you about my favorite, I think my favorite acronym in aviation, which is SLOP. So can you talk about SLOP? Uh, when should it be used? And is it almost kind of a requirement to be used? SLOP. So yes, uh, SLOP stands for, for those who don't know, Strategic Lateral Offset Procedure. And that's a very grand title for uh, flying one or two miles to the right of the track, basically. Um, so... Uh, the first to roll back a few steps. Why do what? Why is slop a thing? Why do we? Why might we want to offset our uh, flight path slightly from the center line of the airway? Don't we want to out navigate as accurately as we possibly can? And the answer to that is no, not really. So in the olden days, uh, the way that it, you know, we used to use uh, inertial navigation systems, which inherently had lots of uh, errors that built up over time. Aircraft would sort of drift away from the uh, dead center of the airway a little bit over time, especially over the Atlantic. Uh, and so you get a sort of a random bit of a distribution of aircraft, some on the center line, some a little bit left or right. And what that meant is actually it made it a little bit safer because if someone climbed through their assigned level, they were very unlikely to be directly underneath the aircraft uh, above them. And so you probably wouldn't hit anybody. Then GPS came along and suddenly we could fix our position to within uh, a couple of meters, right? Great, fantastic. Isn't that what a brilliant uh, innovation? And yes, it is. Uh, but then you suddenly had every aircraft flying exactly along the center line of the aircraft, exactly stacked along e across at the top of each other. So now if someone goes off their level a little bit, suddenly you can see exactly what's going to happen. You're going to have, you're much more likely to hit something. So uh, to mitigate that, uh, 
uh, basically um, we said, well, okay, why don't we manually, randomly try and distribute aircraft off the center line a little bit? And so the way we do that in non-radar airspace only. So this is only once you get to the oceanic entry point and you have to go back to the center line of the track by the time you go over the exit point of the airway. Once you're back in domestic airspace with radar, you need to be exactly back on that center line again. Um, the way we do that is we use an offset, a route offset. So uh, always to the right of track. And basically the idea is it should be as random as possible. So uh, rather than saying, I am always gonna offset one mile right, it's not really quite in the spirit of it because if everybody does that, then you don't get this random distribution. So ideally you would come up with some random way of deciding, am I gonna fly the center line? Am I going to offset one mile right, or am I going to offset two miles right? Flip a coin, something like that. Ubiquitous three-sided coin, yeah, exactly. Yeah, three-sided coin, yeah, exactly, something like that. <laughs> um, and uh, then you would, you know, once you decide that, you would have to go into your FMS. So your FMS has to have an automatic route offset system to, to do this. You can't just sort of do it manually. Um, usually you'll find it in Boeing stuff. Certainly you find it on the route page, I think it is, uh, and you'll be able to go offset R1 or R2. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, and then you just stick it into your FMS R1, R2, and that will just take you slightly to the right, you know, just distribute away around the center line. The other reason for doing it, you might, so uh, guys might also do it in real life if they're sat behind another aircraft, and the weight turbulence is coming down and they're in the weight turbulence, you could offset right to get out of the weight turbulence a little bit. So that's another um, reason so that, that people might be encouraged to yeah. do that. But yes, so yes, you can do it. Uh, it. You should do it, but do it randomly. There's a thing, there's a myth, I think, that it's used for weather avoidance or for overtaking. It's not used for either of those things. Um, and then the other thing to, to Simon's point about it, it has to be supported by your FMC or you shouldn't do it. Like you shouldn't just manually enter an offset to all of your oceanic waypoints. And the reason for that is because that induces a high degree of potential errors. So if your system automatically does it, great, do that. If it doesn't support it, then great. You're just flying a, a slop of zero today. Perfect. Yeah, yeah I think question. Simon, oh, sorry. Yeah, you're good, Ben. I think I think so. I mentioned it, but it, obviously it's a maximum of two miles to the right as well. Uh, so no more than two. I think you can. Is it point one yeah, nautical zero, miles? Zero, one, increments? or two, right? Can you can exactly, you do yeah. can you do point one nautical mile increments, or is that something completely different? That I've got mixed up with. Uh, I don't know. It, it should just be zero, one, or two zero miles. Two. So in oh, one yeah. mile increments, basically. Cool. Yeah. And ATC is not going to tell you to do that or not do that. That's just a thing that you do in oceanic airspace need to make sure that right. you don't have that turned yeah. on. Right. Assigning it airspace. destroys the whole random idea of it. Yeah. Exactly. And you don't have to tell you and you don't have to nor should you tell ATC about it either. So you don't say I'm offsetting or whatever like that. It's your little secret. You and your Twitch followers. <laughs> All right. Uh position reports question from Jeff. Are position reports required in oceanic airspace? Uh no absolutely not and I should have mentioned this earlier. So a very good question. Um so yeah we don't simulate those um by default on Vatsim anymore. Um, so it's similar to the, the, the request and clearance side of things. Outside of CTP, absolutely no problem. If a, if a pilot wants to um, simulate uh, you know, a, a lack of ADS-BC, um, we, we can accommodate that and we can facilitate position reports. But for CTP, again, we ask that no one, no one provides it. It's just too much. Um, again, it's not uncommon to have one controller having maybe 20, 30, uh, you know, some cases that's even more than that, uh, you know, uh, over 30 pilots on a single frequency. Um, it's just too much. Um, people, not, not, not only giving the clearance, but, you know, if a controller is spending two minutes to do that clearance and they're missing handing off planes to the next controller and people get lost, and it's just, it causes a lot of headaches. So, yeah, we ask that no one does it for CTP. Yeah, perfect. And one follow-up for Simon regarding your commentary around the cell cal thing. If they turn off the radio in the aircraft and they have it set up, will the cell cal chimes still come through vPilot? Uh, no. Well, so define turn off. So you have to still be able to receive text messages, essentially, because that's how it works, uh, through vPilot on the radio frequency. So if you turn the radio off, so you're no longer receiving, no, you will not receive the cell call ping. You turn the volume down on your headset, yes, fine. 
Uh, if you uh, take your headset off, yes, fine. Uh, but no, if you turn the radio off or tune to a different frequency, you'll know so anything to, to take you off of that frequency so you can no longer receive communications, text communications to the pilot uh, will stop you receiving the cell call ping. You still have to be actively tuned to the frequency so that messages can still come through. Perfect. So moving now into the America side of things and a lot of questions specific to the US, but I guess it applies to other destinations as well. Charlie asked if controllers are planning to use CPDLC for climb and descent. So specifically in the US, but also you could talk to other jurisdictions as well, Rob. Uh, I wouldn't be able to speak for other jurisdictions. In the US, North America, I, there may be a few, but I would count on probably not. Um, it's It's kind of so use of uh, a client like Hoppy that is kind of up to the individual controller, um, but that is it's kind of external. It's not really a, a that's in only tool. So it's just hit or miss. Some some controllers use it. Some controllers don't. I would say expect not to to uh, see it used. Yeah, I agree. yeah. I think I know CRC, which is the U.S. radar client, very much doesn't have it integrated. And if you don't have it integrated as a controller into the controller client, it gets really, really, really clunky to use. So people don't use it in that way. Um, I would imagine, I guess, potentially there are some places that use Euroscope, for example, that might. Uh, but certainly I would imagine anywhere in the US that uses CRC, absolutely not. Yeah, it's pretty rare in the United States right now. So you could probably anticipate more just voice clearances for the time being for almost everything. A good question from Mark about charts. Are Navigraph charts suitable sources for everything we need, or is there a specific chart provider we should be using? I would say the Navigraph desktop chart uh, app is 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 absolutely adequate and probably, in my opinion, the best resource, although Navigraph does not sponsor my channel, so I won't say that officially. Um, <laughs> But uh, but it is a very if comprehensive resource globally. <laughs> right? yeah. ding, ding. Um, so it is a very comprehensive resource. And if you have the Navigraph subscription with the with the data and the charts, you're covered. You're going to be good. They um, sponsor Flight Sim Expo, so I can shout them out. So there you go. You <laughs> yeah. can do that. <laughs> uh, but I think it, it does speak to a really good point about the difference in charts, right? So Navigraph charts are typically going to be Jeppesen charts, which are going to look and feel different than, say, a NAS chart, which you might find off of the FAA's websites or places like AirNav, SkyVector, stuff like that. So do keep that in mind that if you are not using Navigraph charts, for example, and you're using ChartVox, which is a great free resource for VATSIM members, those charts are going to look different country to country, whereas the Navigraph ones are probably going to look quite similar in terms of the form formats that they use. Right. So that's something to keep in mind, but there's no specific requirement as long as you have the current charts from somebody and you can interpret them. That's really all we're looking for. Uh, yeah. Question. And I'd say Sorry, yeah. on that as well, actually, the really that's one of the great advantages of using something like Navigraph or Aerosoft charts or whatever, something like that, because it means that you're basically going to get the same presentation yeah. of information wherever you go. So, you know, once you've learned it once, you know it. Yep, exactly. A question from Steve, this is probably uh, just a phraseology thing, but it's a good question. You know, do you have to say 1, 2,000 or is it 12,000 or, you know, what's the best practice in terms of radio phraseology and readbacks? Whoever wants to take that one. The best practice in terms of uh, thousands is the individual digit and then the word thousands. Um, but uh, it, if, if it is a readback and you've expressed that you understood what was told to you and the, the controller has confidence that you did understand what was told to you, it's adequate. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, the general thing with IFR that's nice is like, you just have to say what the controller says to you. So most of the time you're just checking on and then whatever they say, you say it back. So if they've said it in a particular way and you can more or less just parrot that, that's kind of the best way to do it. And like Rob says, as long as they've understood that you've understood what you are supposed to do, that is what we're looking for. And as always, if you're not sure, get clarification. Don't just make a guess and say, oh, I think he said this. Well, I'll just do that. You know, let's just make sure. Uh, and one more officially sorry, speaking, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll just want to expand yeah. on that just a touch. Officially speaking, um, if you want, as a controller, you're issuing an altitude that's uh, 10,000 or higher, um, and you want to just restate it for clarification, you True. could say something like 1, 2,000, 12,000. What you hear a lot of U.S. controllers do, real life and VATSIM, is 1, 2, 12,000. Not technically correct and can be confusing, can be misinterpreted, but you do hear it. So just can be a, have your ear out for that. Yeah, good point. 
and wrapping up now, I don't really see any other questions. I'll just hit on you know one more point because there was a little bit of discussion about this in the chat. We as VATSIM controllers and the organizers of the event, we try to accommodate people as best we can, but this is just not the event to sort of be that person who really wants to be accommodated. So there was a bit of discussion about like, can I fly a non-RNAV airplane and can I ask for vectors? And in practice, like, you know, probably if you request for vectors on the day of because you decided to fly an airplane that doesn't have nav capability, probably will be nice and we'll probably give those to you, but you're just adding workload for every single person involved. And it is quite possible that someone is going to say, you know what, I can't, I've just got too much going on. You know, you're supposed to do this in a certain way. So sorry, but you're not getting those. And then who knows what happens. So I there's really always going to be you. one or two. Yeah. Where the problem is when it becomes 10 or 30 or 50 yeah. out of yeah. the thousand. You know? So, you know, if you're in that situation where, oh no, my navigation has failed, or I can't load this particular procedure into the box, like inadvertently, please do speak up in that case. And yes, of course, we'll be happy to do our best and, and you'll be a heading, no problem. If something isn't working, you know, let us know. But like going into the event, intentionally not being able to do the thing that you have signed up to do, you're just adding workload to everybody else. So it'll probably be okay most of the time, except as Rob says, when you get to the 10th person in the row, when you're in the middle of holding because we have a problem going on, you know, it does just make it more difficult for everybody else. So the Cross the Pond team, the planning folks especially, They've worked very hard to take this event from what was once basically just chaos to like a very well organized and not even chaotic experience that's fun, that's busy, but that's still sustainable for everybody. And we're really just trying to promote that and keep that going so we can keep running the event. So that's the recommendation is just really try to do the route that you're given. If you want to do that in an airplane that's not RNF capable, if you can find a way to make it work, like that's totally cool. And again, as always, if you run into a problem and you need some help, just don't ever be afraid to make that ask. So I think that's all we have. Have. We'll wrap things up. Simon, Ben, Rob, any last comments, thoughts, suggestions, tips, advice? Nothing. My only closing comment is, is Evan, as always, thank you for being the mastermind behind these webinars. I know that they are they are truly appreciated within the community. And, you know, I'm somebody that has gone great lengths since probably the last nine years to try and improve pilot education on the network. And, you know, this, these things are really well attended and and I really truly appreciate all the effort that you've put into uh, putting these together. Thanks, Rob. I appreciate that. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah um, second that. Sorry, sorry. And as uh, I second that and also and the only thing I'd uh, really add as well is uh have fun, you know, enjoy yeah. it. You know, that's uh that's what we're, you know, that that's what we're here for. That's what it's it's all about. So, yeah, um in, re enjoy it, relax. Uh Follow the you know the advice. Look, read those pilot briefings, all that good stuff, and everybody will have a great time. Yep, and then just me again. Third, that really, uh, you know, th thank you very much for uh, to Evan and, and the rest of the organisers uh, for for putting the event together. Like I say, it's like everyone was saying as well. It's uh, it really has come a long way even in the space of five years. I remember flying one of you know one of my first times, and I'm quite new to Vat Sims. So it's probably 2018, 2019. And, you know, it was complete chaos. There was a, a person playing. I think the control was actually logged off over the ocean because it was too busy. And a pilot was flying along playing Dewey Sandstorm for 15 minutes in the frequency. Um, and there was no supervisors there to kick him off because they were all too busy. So it, it's gone from that to now, like, very organized um, sort of semblance of, you know, a real-world transatlantic flight between busy airports. Um, it will be a, a very great flight for those of you that's not, that have not experienced it before. So yeah, do enjoy. Perfect. Well, thanks guys. I mean, appreciate your efforts in putting all these together, doing the rehearsal that we did a couple of weeks ago and just the time commitment to do this. And to those of you for watching, like, you know, we've had great turnout today, great comments in the chat, great questions. So thank you to all of you for doing that and for taking, you know, a step to do something that is a little bit educational, a little bit different. We're not just sitting here doing our regular flight or watching somebody do a flight, but we're actually just thinking, learning, doing something that's a bit different. So I applaud yourselves for taking the time to participate. Have a wonderful time on Saturday if I'm not there i will do my best to join i hope i get to join but if not uh, it'll be the first cross the pond that i've missed in many so hopefully fingers crossed that everything plays out well again to simon ben rob our chat thank you so much everybody for watching you can find all the details and the slides from today's presentation over on our website appreciate you being here and have a great flight on sunday saturday